thank the Department of Visual Arts and also the Faculty of Arts and Humanities for supporting this series. So it's my great pleasure to welcome an artist who I very much admire and a dear friend who's going to speak with us this evening. I first came to know Francine Savard's work when I had the pleasure to cu curate a group exhibition entitled Lines Painted in Early Spring that involved her shaped paintings, as well as paintings by Gerald Ferguson, Ben Reeves, and Carmen Ruschinski. The show began at the Southern Alberta Art Gallery in Lethbridge and traveled to Kamloops, Toronto, Owen Sound, and Montreal between 2003 and 4. At that time, I came to know Francine as a premier artist and thinker and a wonderful and jovial person to hang out with in small towns and large towns across the land. And I take some personal credit for having introduced her to a bit of Canada west of Toronto. Uh, Francine's practice is rooted in the plasticien tradition from Quebec that I know some of the students in are presently studying in art history. She incorporates various painting-related preoccupations in her work, including references to the studio, painter's tools, and the history of painting. And as you, you'll see, and I know will enjoy, her works often take the form of monochromatic shaped canvas, canvases and explore themes that include the relationship between visuality and language. Francine Savard is based in Montreal and after studying graphic design at the Royal College of Art in London she earned her master's degree in visual arts from the Université de Québec à Montréal in 1994. In 2009-10, the Musée d'Art Contemporain de Montreal presented a large retrospective of her work, and among her recent 2013 exhibitions are the painting project, A Snapshot of Painting in Canada, um, at Gallery Lucam. She has had five solo exhibitions at uh, Gallery René Blouin, Montreal, and four at Diaz Contemporary in Toronto. Her work can be found in the collections of the National Gallery of Canada, the Musée uh, National des Beaux-Arts du Québec and the Musée d'Art Contemporain de Montréal and the Albright Knox Gallery. So please help me to welcome Francine Savard. Thank you. Julia, is it okay? Uh, thank you, Patrick, uh, for inviting me and uh, keeping uh, interest in my work. You know. uh, tonight I'm going to show you images from uh, this survey exhibition of my work that took place at the Musée d'Art Contemporain in 2009-2010. Throughout uh, those images, I inserted news and details of the first original presentation prior to this exhibition. Uh, plus, I will show a few examples of my most recent work. So let's start with images. This is Guido Molinari's Politic Dance Side of 1987, collection of the National Gallery uh, of Canada. And Claude Tousignan, Coudry Achève of uh, 1982, collection of the Musée d'Art Contemporain de Montréal. And this is the first image of my work. Uh, it is the view of uh, the exhibition at the Musée d'Art Contemporain de Montréal, which I will refer often as the MAC from now on. Uh, a survey exhibition of 15 years of my work. I started with those two references from Quebec's art history in order to present the family I come from and disclose my awareness of the field of historical accomplishment and, if I may say, the springboard from which I dive. The map exhibition was curated by Leslie Johnstone. This operation of putting together a survey exhibition was a real treat. Creating and watching the reciprocal effect given by the presentation of an heterogeneous batch of paintings and objects was a powerful exercise. With this reunion, I felt that multiple narratives could take place and multiple levels of conceptual characteristic as well as aesthetic qualities would be attached and hopefully funded in the artworks. I envisioned this exhibition with pieces that would dialogue not only on the basis of color or form acquaintance, but with the pursuit of a supplement, a conversation or a confrontation between pieces a network of relationship, a rumor going from one piece to another. 
This reunion of works shows, by the diversity of proposals, a number of variations in the exploration of languages that I make use of, uh, those of color, of text, and form. The end result deals with process, phenomena, and perception, as well as it deals with topics linked to historical, cultural, or literary forms. It does not proceed chronologically. Instead, we put together ensembles that reflect a similarity in the references or method of development. I often work around what I would call studio events. In that space, I encounter, with an oblique sensitivity, an empty frame, a roll of canvas, or a pot of dry paint, for example. Because the studio is also the best place to read and write, there will be also library events, let me see. There I gather books and newspapers, make lists of words, quotations, or titles that kind of flash under my eyes, and those two functions of the studio form only one reality. Ordering, measuring, and encoding will come afterwards <coughs> as tool for translation and adaptation of the material. For that ter transformation, I sometimes work by establishing a set of rules, which supply almost all the necessary procedures and material decisions, preventing me from looking at a painting in the making with any compositional, hierarchical, or taste judgment. Nevertheless, those decisions do not entirely take in consideration all aspects of the making. A painting, at any moment, can and often will turn itself into a highly sensitive field where I must watch the outbreaks of any unnecessary sign in order for my work, in its minimalist nature, not to be wrongly interpreted. Back to this view. On the wall, <coughs> The red painting is entitled 7,104 square inches of red. And on the floor, there is untitled ensemble of 1998. The red painting is a 2009 rework of one that was done in 1992, in the first year of my master's degree. By that time, I had seen the two precedent red monochrome paintings of Molinari and Tuzignan. They had a big effect on me, and it really was, for a long time, what I wanted to paint. So one day, I took the first pot of red paint I had within reach and covered a large, already existing, full of marks canvas, edge to edge. Here I'm showing the, the complete, uh, the remade version, in fact. And dissatisfa dissatisfaction didn't last long. And unexpectedly, I wrote on the top of the painting a segment of the text I was writing at that time, which says, this is a detail, il y avait un drap blanc, there was a white sheet. When I stepped back from this amalgame, I realized I had bent a monochrome painting, usually aimed towards perception and read as a metaphysical or a materialistic object, bent it into a reservoir of imaginary substances. I, I ended up with a sort of cinematographic screen that triggered the imagination while speaking of the painting process itself. I used to call it my first painting. The actual work in this exhibition, as I said, is a remake of 2009. For the occasion of this retrospective, it had to be perfectly done without any of the marks that filled the first one in order to satisfy my, dem my demands for this presentation. I, it had to play on the level, the level of an idea, not on my personal history of pain and blame. Untitled Ensemble is the canvas of a white painting rolled on a tube. It rests on a wooded volume that takes the place of its base or of its crate. Presented at the beginning of the show, 
This face-to-face -face situation with the red painting introduces one aspect of this exhibition that will be further developed on many occasions, which is the dialectic point of view on the subject of painting as a surface and painting as an object. You may remember that both Polinelli and Tuzinha paintings were touching or resting on the floor. <coughs> this fact, nevertheless, implies very different consequences toward their reception than any of the painting as an object as I see it. On title and symbol was originally paint was originally part of a painting exhibition entitled the painting, the painting's room, Stockholm, which surprisingly presented no painting as usually understood. Here there were carcass of painting, empty structure without canvas, or canvas as recumbent statues rolled and displayed on the floor. There, on, on the back wall, another ensemble was forming a pictorial plan floating at a distance from the wall. On one hand, the visual propositions stay between painting, sculpture, and installation as categories of artistic disciplines, but with the impossibility of naming any. On the other hand, the space stood for a place between a workshop, the exhibition room, and the stock room. It is like the frozen moment between what had just happened and what is going to happen, with the material in waiting of being installed, or, on the contrary, a dismantled exhibition. Let's go back to the black exhibition. Apart from that, from that twin painting proposition, surface and object, the presence of text under many forms and allusions is also featured in my work. It could be the inscription of a fictional text of mine, the use of quotations, the use of the lexicon model, the analysis or simile analysis of art commentaries, book titles borrowed from my own use, or the use of call numbers in reference to the library. There on the left, the video Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe sur was presented in loop. It is, of course, a reference to Manet, the luncheon on the graphs. I film in a zoom motion a text I wrote with the, which described the photo of a family summer picnic. While the text becomes more and more readable, it starts to decompose itself in, a, in an electronic green field where only fragments of the text appear for a few seconds. Those fragments were chosen to show words that would indicate the gaze, like on voit, as well as words for food that are also used for colors, like olive, orange, prune, eggshell, etc. It serves to introduce the subject of artistry and of color, which is also developed uh, all along the exhibition. And this is the view of uh, my ma the exhibition of my master degree. It was first presented in my master degree exhibition. The photo of the déjeuner sur l'herbe was the reference on which the old exhibition leaned. The monitor and projector apparatus were mostly the sources of light. The old space was a camera obscura, where paintings seemed to emerge into the light and from it. In the background, the painting of 1997 entitled De la Peinture, as its title borrowed from Leon Battista Alberti, De la Pintura. This is a large nine by, sorry, seven by nine foot white on white list of 371 call numbers cryptic under the system of the Library of Congress. Those codes 
represent a large range of books on diversified contemporary and historical painting references I collected and saved over the years from the university library. Through these literary allusions, the painting manifests a self-reflexive gesture. In 1998, it was one of two artworks I presented in a collective exhibition called Le Mensonge de la Couleur, the, the Lie of Color. Where did those words come from? If you, I have a little anecdote. I hope I won't bore you with that. Anyway. Uh, in 1991, the French author Florence Delay wrote about an anecdotal moment narrated by Jose Bergamin, a famous Spanish intellectual, who witnessed with others in 1937 the revealing of the, of the unfinished Guernica by Picasso himself in his studio. We learn in that text, one, that Picasso wanted to add colors to Guernica. Two, that his friends attending su suggested to try before with color paper, which he did, Three, that Picasso then realized the Arlequin effect created. Bergamin orderly used the words, Picasso became aware of le mensonge de la couleur. A nice statement by itself, but a heavy one, considering the weight of any historical document and the relative consequences around the idea of truth and lie in painting. This sentence was interesting enough for five painters and one theoretician to work on such an affirmation. On almost the same subject, in the background of this view, is a section in the section of the Mac exhibition that develops the idea of the library. It is La Pharmacie de Platon of 1995-1997. Included in a larger project that was the exhibition called La Chambre à Peinture, The Painting Room, of 1997, this ensemble, La Pharmacie de Platon, gathers 300 on 399 small 4 by 6 inch paintings and takes its title from a text by Jacques Derrida. Derrida, recalling Socrate, reminds us that in the registry of memory, speech is a live memory while writing is a dead one. With writing, we surrender to oblivion, and that ineluctable solution can be compared to a pharmacon, which translates from the Greek as a remedy and as a poison. Every canvas of the work was painted in a slightly different shade of gray. The ensemble has a very low threshold level of color. If we consider unlimited the palette of colors, then it is a lamelliform cutting into the chromatic infinity. And the same could be said of those call numbers. They represent a lamelliform cutting in the infinity of knowledge. It took me two years to complete that work, and even though I seem to justify it by the content of Derrida's text, it is only at the end of the process that I got to know that text and decided to take advantage of this reading. My first objective for that original presentation was the idea of a room as a laboratory. The rectangular canvases disposed in a grid formation recall the drawers of a monopotecary shops, laboratories, dispensary, or columbarium. The artworks tends to work against the assertion that the grid would silence narratives and discourse. Nevertheless, call numbers are torments for the memory. Their unpronounceable characters are like a field of words <coughs> where no part can be named. This is the original presentation. The path of this 1997 presentation ended up with a quote by Georges Bataille that says, La vérité est expérimentale. Truth is experimental. It fitted perfectly well with the clinical aspect I wanted to give. Surrounded by paintings as drawers, painting as a bed, painting as charts, I wanted to place the viewer in a laboratory 
that measures and monitors the domesticated human. So this is how I treated the Georges Bataille quote. Back to the map. <coughs> In each of those blue paintings, we can recognize the form of a text. Their flush left edges and jagged right ones are unmistakable. These are four of a series of eight paintings made in 2006. For that project, I used a commentary text by French art historians Jacqueline Lichtenstein and Jean-Pierre Roulier. It's a 5,000 words text on the work of a French painter, the French painter François Morellet. It, I classified every word of it in eight grammatical categories. The statistic compilation of this defragmented text conveys the precise size and the unique jagged form of each painting. This notion of defragmentation was revealed to me with look, uh, when looking at, at the, the action of a software, uh, supposed not to be you know, needed anymore, no. The software that I used to clean and put in order the art disk of my computer. This par particular software, software recognizes each type of document and classifies all documents of the same type together. It does that with an open window on the screen in order to follow the progress of the classified result. Each category of document <coughs> being in its own color, it is easy to, first of all, acknowledge the disorganized artist, and afterwards, the well put together outcome. The individual title of each painting is formed by a percentage associated with a letter and refers to the quantity of words for each grammatical category. On the left, it's N for names, equal 30%, and on the, on the right, D for determiner, equal 10%. Each painting made as a measuring tool, measuring units, is nevertheless not a piece of a puzzle, but the abstract idea of a complete work. While the initial impulse was sparked by an admiration for the original text, the measured statistical analysis empties that text of all meaning, neutralizing it, and led to the creation of new paintings. With the data given by this defragmentation, I then decide, in order to measure the fragmentation of the er initial text, to put back each word in, of each category in its own place in the original text. Each word is represented by a rectangle corresponding to its length. So contrary to the effect of the cleaning application on my computer, the cow in a text makes more sense than its defragmented state. This word definitely manifests a dialectical tension between order and disorder. And those paintings have the same title as the blue ones, except for the addition of the word partition, scores. They are N, this one is N for 30%, D, determiner, 10%, and S for substitute, 4%. The partition series was presented in the Mac exhibition as well, in a room of its own and associated, associated with the soundtrack. I had this utopian idea that if I play all partitions together, I could hear the source text. So I recorded a reader saying the words of each category on a different track, leaving unpronounced the words of the other seven categories represented by the white in each painting. Then I superimpose all soundtrack. I suspected that unwanted silences and superpositions of words will occur, and that the results, anyways, would offer something close to the original. But it reveals itself to be quite chaotic and very demanding on the reader, even though she was very skilled. 
Nevertheless, on the subject of chaos and neutrality, it was quite interesting. With the soundtrack, I tried to accentuate the possibility of deconstructing the text once more and verify what could stay of a possible meaning in such a reconstruction where expressiveness had been cancelled, cancelled and the smoothness of the speech would be condemned to silence. Unfortunately, I don't have a soundtrack. <laughs> I know that I read that for to some friends, and they said we want to hear it, please. <laughs> but uh, I, I didn't find a way to incorporate it. I'm not uh, good with all those machines. Uh, back to the Mac. <laughs> this in installation, in parallel, emphasizes the ambivalence into considering a painting as a surface or as an object. My model for those two ensembles was a simple cardboard box. Prior to the paintings, I made a large series of photographs from a number of boxes opened in diverse positions. I used those photographs to make an outline drawing of each form. The five paintings ensemble on the back wall is titled Je déballe ma bibliothèque, title borrowed from the essay Unpacking My Library by the German philosopher <coughs> Walter Benjamin, in which he muses on the act of collecting as he unpacks his own library after two years in trunks. Again, a late choice for a title. On the theme of the library, it places us at the moment before classification, which brings back to mind the presence of the call numbers not too far in the library section of the exhibition. For those paintings, a set of parameters were chosen to underline the, posi the position of what I like to call a quasi object. In addition to their shapes, size and color accentuate their proximity to the reference. The two elements on the front wall, sorry, it's another view in, in another exhibition are entitled Element 17D and Element 19B. It follows the numbers of the photographs when I was taking it. Constructed in plywood and left untreated, they were made to emphasize the path from the cardboard model to the silhouette, then back to the reality of new containers. Those two ensembles are the works that maybe negotiate most between the categories of abstraction and figuration. Here is a view of the presentation that originally included those series at Diaz Contemporary in Toronto. To recap, the five beige, beige paintings resemble architectural plans. The two plywood elements reaffirm the reality of the model. And here, the eight black ones, for their part, possess the virtual three-dimensional quality of rising from the wall at one point or car carving in at another time. <coughs> and back to the map. <coughs> this view introduces on the left wall five paintings of the city on Plain Reveal of 2000. Their titles from left to right are a yellow field, a blue surface, an orange panel, a green coastline, a pink spot. The complete series of 11 paintings was originally presented in 2001 at Galerie René Blouin in Montreal. They are monochrome paintings with a word painted in their center. Those words come from two commentary texts about Fernand Le Duc's painting of the 50s. The abundant number of words used by the authors to describe Le Duc's flat, hard edge abstract paintings, although they were not made with the help of masking tape, I mean, most of all, uh, which I think the term hard edge leads anyone to think. So these words were very intriguing to me. For example, an area, a stretch, a surface, a side, a section, a literal, a spot, a figure, a solid, a form, a plant, spreadings, all. 
So I proceeded by making a list of words on one side, and on the other side, a compilation of Ludwig's painting within which the shapes seem to me strange, complex, exotic, in short, shapes without names. Then I matched the writer's words with the Ludwig shapes I thought would fit, adding the color as a third parameter. Not only is this a reflection on the connotation of those, these terms, it also proposes by the same operation a question to the viewer about language. Is language always naturally understandable? At the René Blouin Gallery. <coughs> Extracting the forms from their original rectangular sites, Le Duc's painting, displaying them as artifacts, and tattooing them with such words in their centers became a mimicry of archaeological and taxonomical processes. These artworks ended up as painting of self-reference in qualities, highlighting the chasm between text and image <coughs> in the discourses of the painting discipline and the arbitrary nature of abstraction. The irony now is to write and talk about them. <laughs> there are two, the, here are two views yes, of the series. First exhibition at Gabriel Nibluan. I chose to make all the paintings of that series about the same size in order not to create any focal point or hierarchy. Then I hung them on the wall on one line, separating them with equal space, which also respect my non-hierarchy desire. In the whole, I think it refers well to the title of the series, Un plein un vide, I translated by full versus void, <laughs> which are words of Fernand Le Duc himself, and may be the best one to talk about forms, space, and pictorial plan in, the, in this context. <coughs> The un plein un vide artworks may look to be in the plastician tradition or a tribute to Fernand Le Duc, but they are much more to me in the order of analysis. By them, I acknowledge the distance traveled in paintings since the 50s and the impossibility to conceive of my work as the plasticians conceive of theirs. At the end, it is not a plastician proposition nor a conceptual one, it is a painting proposition assisted by art theory, I may say. It was my first solo exhibition at Galerie René Blouin. In the main gallery, I displayed 11 shaped canvas of this series. And in the small room of the gallery, René Blouin exhibited one large canvas of 1978 by the late Yves Gaucher, entitled Orange Jaune. With this clever presentation, what could, one could clearly acknowledge what I would call the diagonal path taken by me for that discipline. On the one hand, a proposal that deeply engages the gaze and the viewer's body. On the other hand, one which discourses the consequences in terms of connotation in the profusion of critical and literary discourses linked to the discipline. Accompanying this exhibition and uh, present in the gallery space uh, was this book entitled Un plein un vide, Lexique du vocabulaire de l'abstraction, one, uh, l'excitation, where all the quotations were listed as well as at the end, uh, at the, in the colophon, uh, all the text sources. It offers a supplement of words for the viewers to mentally challenge their own idea of forms. Here, a three-dimensional structure of 2000 offers a visual strolling through Mondrianesque compositions where the flatness of the grid is reinterpreted in the real. This construction offers multiple openings with croppings that display a maze of pictorial propositions. This big object presents itself as a storage rack bearing voice that reaches to the idea of the collection. 
the idea of the missing object, the object of desire. And uh, this place is entitled Chazi pour objet du désir, wrap for the, the desire object. But let's go on to this. In the background, there is Les couleurs de Cézanne dans les mots de Rilke, 36 on 100 essay, a work of 1998. In fact, it's uh, the second work that was uh, uh, mixed with the large white painting with uh, call numbers in the beginning. <coughs> the reading of Rilke's Lettres sur Cézanne inspired me this project. This book gathers letters to his wife that Rilke wrote in 1907 from Paris, where he fre frequently visits the Cézanne retrospective of Le Salon d'Automne. In those letters, he profusely describes the color of Cézanne's painting, and the vocabulary is fascinating. While reading the book, I asked myself, what could be this or that color? <coughs> In order to think deeply about this problematic question and give back to painting what Rilke contributed in beautiful words, I decided to push further my investigation of what, as a reader and as a painter, could be those colors. I based my research on my own subjectivity never consulting any Cézanne's painting or any reproduction. Those terms were of a large variety. Some of them speak of color as we are used to, for example, light green, dark blue. Others ask for more subtlety and subjectivity, as new natural yellow or a damp brown violet. Some expressions use terms that may have been understood at the time, like 18th century blue. Other ask for more differentiation, like the red, a red, his red. Finally, there are also poetic inventions, like the internal carmine, <coughs> or buried violets, or subtle and vague lilac. On each uh, painting, I uh, painted kind of tone on tone the words uh, of Rilke. In total, they were 100 statements. The establishment of the first reunion of 36 of them in 1998 was governed by the height of the available wall, the length of each painting being determined by the length of the terms. The sequence of the presentation was based on the possibility of creating the motif of the recorded voice. The adjacent book, placed in a frame, has my name as the author, the title of the artwork as its own title, and the mentioned essay. Interestingly, this word, essay, finds itself in the middle of the map exhibition at the articulation of the two rooms of the museum space. Esse is a literary form that I refer to for my own work. Analogically, I could be the essayist who meets his object while juxtaposing different paradigms of readability. This work is an attempt to be true to the words, highlighting the subjective and highly enigmatic nature of color. As for our plain our vid series, it became a painting lesson to me. Again, back to the map. Before going into the second room for good, let me talk a little about the artwork on the right. It is Promenade en 56 tableaux of 1993. It introduces a big part of another aspect of my work that is going to be de developed farther. This polyptych of 56 parts looks like a grid with an erratic development. It comes from a section of the plant of Le Marais in Paris, where is located the Picasso Museum. The original map could be found in every Paris gallery, given information on exhibitions to be seen, addresses of galleries, opening hours, etc. It is a delicate balance between abstract forms and referential content. The title takes care of the referent, as well as the viewer's 
eyes strolling about through the reunion of parts. I created a coded reference for each piece of the ensemble and inscribed it on a lateral side. I conceived this reference in order to give the position of each part of the politic relatively to its geographical location in the city, as well as its position in the politic itself, thus taking into consideration the here and the elsewhere. Interestingly, in the map exhibition, was the back-to-back -back presentation of the Paris plan with this other work, Le Depot de Peinture of 2000. This polyptic is referencing a deposit of dry paint discovered in my studio at the bottom of a forgotten container. Coincidentally, the round form of the pot of paint corresponds to many looking devices like the eye, the lens, and most of all, the magnifying glass. The motif of this macro vision does not appropriately present a specific path of reading. It offered instead, as an all-over proposition, a focus on the state of the matter. The wall as a carrier fight for the reading of the work with the 125 wood elements. The work calls upon the moment of a lost condition, the ruin of its functionality an archaeological site, site. It refers to the now and the before. From my point of view, it is a Veritas painting. The series of X's on the right wall leads us to yet another map. This work of 2004 is titled Moi, Toi, Ici, Laba me, you, here, there. It is the reunion of, on one wall, a white map, on the wall across, a black X, plus the space between them. <coughs> the main element is a relatively large-scale reversed map of a white Canada, Newfoundland at the west and British Columbia, Columbia at the east. Painted on the left side of the map, at the exact place where Montreal is, there is a small black X. As I said, a larger black X shape is positioned on the opposite wall. Those two elements, white map and black X, incompatible in terms of scale, are connected the way a landmark is to a map. This work places the viewers in an uncomfortable position in that looking at one element head on forces them to turn their back on the other. A flow of dual relations and indeterminate crisscrossing occupy the space. Me, you, and here, there, but also me, here, you, there. Also, the reverse presentation of the map as the consequence of placing the viewer as inside a balloon at the art of the planet, looking at the surface of the Earth, as if the real world we know would be the reverse side of a globe. Those three maps, promenade, depot, and here, there, comprise a multitude of shaped canvas that, despite the complexity of their forms, are read as unified whole thanks to their monochromatic treatment and the recollection of the viewer's previous experiences. They all conjure ideas of presence and absence, of movement through space and time, and of mapping of sight and surfaces. Maps, plans, graphs, statistical tables, and charts are systems of organizing data and presenting information that I often make use of in my work. We enter a space where, for some of the works, I use the gathering of epi epigraphs as, as source material. Epigraphs are a very special kind of quotation. They are charged with significance. Placed at the opening of a book or a chapter, their functions range from dedication to commentary, from legitimation to the acknowledgement of filiation. 
Here, matte paint plays a role in a series of seven pale green can canvases of 2009, which four of them were presented at the MAC. This series is entitled Without. The dash-like colored marking, markings that cover the surface of each painting are reminiscent of that that processing touch card. They, in fact, indicate the specific location of each word from a sentence by Georges Bataille, used as an epigraph by Georges Didier Huberman in his book, Devant le Temps. I know it looks complicated. <laughs> the wording of the epigraph is, tout problème en un certain sens en est un d'emploi du temps. Every problem, in a certain way, is a problem of the use of time. Those words are a signal as they appear in seven different texts. Initially, my project was to find and map every word in the sentence in one text. Unfortunately, even with those few very simple words to look for, I couldn't find one single text that would contain all of them. The caption, which appears at the bottom of each painting, provides the complete epigraph, as well as the key to the color coding. The title of each painting, without certain, or without problem and without use, refers to the inevitable absence of some of the terms from some of the texts, and thus signals both the utopian nature of the initial quest and the acceptance <coughs> of the ultimate failure. Facing the wall of the green paintings were displayed 19 paintings that use a number of epi epigraphs I collected over the years. For example, as title, they are quoted as an epigraph by Yves Bois, quoted by René Payan, you know, quoted by Massimo Cacciari, quoted by Celeste Olalkiaga. One. Quoted by Thierry de Dur. Like the previous authors that made use of those lines, eminent figures of European and North American art theory, I selected the words for my own use. The shape of each painting follows the typographical presentation of the complete quotation. Here, the visible, readable text dialogues with the invisible one whose absence is plain to see. The authors that quote, as well as those who are cited, constitute a web of philosophers, critics, artists, and poets who have nourished my meditation on painting over the years. I completed this installation around the theme of epigraphs by the presentation in an adjacent display case of a large three by seven foot print entitled Tableau Chronologique, Chronological Chart. This is a, a, a detail. It displays a constellation of well-known authors pollinating across disciplines of study. It sheds light on the scientific pretenses of this corpus. As a mockery of objectivity, that puts me in the core of a personal fiction this web of lines and names adopts almost the anxiety aspect of the quest. I am ending this tour of the MAC exhibition with this work of 2009 entitled Tu M Un Dernier Tableau. It is made of 44 rhombuses, non-equilateral diamond shapes, mounted on an aluminum arm about seven meters in length and one meter extending from the wall, literally floating in the space. It is a direct call to part of Marcel Duchamp's last painting, entitled Tu M of 1918. <coughs> Duchamp's title is detailed as follows, Tu as you plus the letter M plus apostrophe. It is a French expression in which the verb is missing, equivalent to you blanc, me. 
The verb must be provided by the viewer. It is said that Duchamp entitled this artwork as an invitation to complete the sentence, the, the sentence. And possible readings are, tu m'ennuies, you bore me, or tu m'emmerdes, a coarser expression with the same meaning. In short, all by bad commentaries addressed to painting which Duchamp disregarded by that time. But straightforwardly, I used to read tu m as you like, you love, like in French, tu m. So I took it very personally and worked with it. In Duchamp's artwork, the color chart, a typical diagrammatic abstract motif, is kind of organized in a perspective construction à la futuriste. The result is the collapsing of the two systems of representation. Duchamp painting also takes into account, in its own way, the third dimension of the real world. I don't have anything to show you, but it planted perpendicularly to the surface is a giant bottle cleaning brush extending almost one meter out from the wall. It's the black form on the, under the white background. Two-thirds. See? So it, yes, it's extending one meter out from the wall. Another aggression towards the viewer, a metaphorical tool serving to suggest the cleaning of the eye, the viewer eye. With this appropriation, maybe I want to, to contradict Marcel Duchamp on that subject. From the tiny white rhombus far to the left, to the large yellow wall that floats three feet of the wall, to an un dernier tableau, follows a surprising curved trajectory. The piece thus demonstrates a three-dimensional, a three-dimension, no, in three dimensions, the illusionary truth of two-dimensional <coughs> perspectival space. One thing is sure. I wanted to work on the boundaries of painting while pushing the investigation further into real space. Tu M un dernier tableau is an artwork that, in a way, liberates the tableau from the wall, lovingly caressing the eye of the beholder while including the work in the long procession of last paintings. And that's and the visit of the Mac exhibition. And I, uh, I uh, prepare a few words around uh, my last uh, work. Uh, there was an exhibition between this and, 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 and that work, but uh, I, uh, it would have been too long. <laughs> yes, let's go right away to the most uh, recent body of works presented last year at Galerie René Blouin as well as at Diaz Contemporary. It is entitled Le Temps qu'il fit. Le temps in French means time as well as weather. But until a better translation, I better call it, I, I simply call it uh, uh, weather and, and give up the polysimus aspect of the title. It is the end result of another act of collective. In June 1999, until May 2001, I decided to key every issue of the daily Montreal newspaper, Le Devoir, with the hope that I could eventually, that it, it could eventually be a useful material for looking back on the passing of the millennium. 10 years later, having to move my studio, I carefully examined the old, mainly the front covers, spreading everything on the floor. I was quickly bored with the material. Then I realized that in June 2000, following the reduction of the size of the newspaper, the weather summary forecast lost its place on the front cover of the newspaper. That was enough of an event for me to work on this subject. It gives me the opportunity to have a look into the great tradition of landscape painting. Amongst many painting manifestations like stomato fog or vibrant lights, Meteorological phenomena have influenced a great number of painters, from Da Vinci to Cézanne to Fernand Le Duc. Besides, the vocabulary 
warm, cold, mist, fog, cloud, etc., is crossing both, both disciplines, and even more in French with words such as éclairci, passage, etc. It was also the abrupt end of a pragmatic list that became for me a traumatic allegory of our own disappearance. So I wrote down the 320 weather forecast of this period and compiled in a statistical manner the occurrences of the main words. I used those statistics to make a few series of work. Some I made 2D paintings, others 3D paintings. I created different categories of words under such topic as weather, which became a series of six paintings that compare sunny, cloudy, variable skies, bright spells, increasing cloudiness, and clearance. Five paintings for a series named Precipitation, with the words rains, snow, flurries, showers, storm, and two paintings in another series, also named Precipitation, in order to compare rain and snow. For the flat ones, I followed the numbers for the construction of a structure under the guidance of a square grid. Then, based on the frequency of each word, I mapped the surface of the painting with the appropriate information, comparing different numbers in the categories. Here, in the weather series, a painting with six square, the number 15 represents 15% of variable square, a variable sky. Also in the weather series, 30 represents 30% of sunny. Here in the precipitation series, five words giving five squares, giving five paintings. The number four represents 4% of flurries. In this other precipitation series, snow and rain are compared. 30 represents 30% of snow. Here is the presentation of some 2D paintings at the as contemporary. But I, what I, oh, other, another view. But what I really want to show you is some examples of what I call the 3D paintings. For these paintings, I converted the numbers into cubic values and made a painting for each value. So the bigger was the number, the larger is the canvas, the deeper is the object. Nuageux oh, is the biggest one in the weather series. I inscribed the words uh, in the middle of the surface. <coughs> and froid is the deepest one in the temperature series. Here's a view of 3D paintings at the As Contemporary where size and depth can be compared. 3D paintings at Galerie Rene Bouin with different pieces. While the size of the paintings and the structure of the grid is, is supported by the data of the weather forecast, I focused my attention on the adjustment of the colors and the search of the luminous effects that I wished. Every word, even the 3Ds, are covered with canvas. Their very small and inevitable texture of the cotton provide the necessary peaks and hollows that reflect the light. It conveys also my stubbornness in calling these paintings. The choice of colors would be like the effect of the weather on me, a matter of mood. To guide me into the, the choice of color palette, I look attentively to Giorgio Morandi. I thought that would be a painter that can inspire this. Uh, it didn't give me all the answers, as you can see, but it helped me explore the link between the suggestibility of color, of, of form, and language which is, to me, a persistent obsession. As a conclusion, yay. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I have text. <laughs> During this presentation, we ran into words where a play between form 
and the wall creates a direct connection with the space. Words that outline the complex and paradoxical relationships between abstraction and representation, objective and subjective perceptions. It is often an attempt to make coexist within a single aesthetic proposition, the corporeal physicality of the painted object and the intellectual stimulus of a concept. During this presentation, we cross through museum and gallery spaces, but also through the library, a library, a camera obscura, a laboratory, a clinic, a studio, a stockroom, the inside of the earth, a field of ruins, an archaeological site. Those are the image of in my work. We pass through words and silence, through art history and poetry. We pass through the here and the there and the elsewhere, through the now and the before. But most of all, we encounter words that want to convoke the most important presence, the one of the viewer. It's finished. <laughs>